Avenue. Hello, Declan. How are you? I'm good. It's a public holiday here in Melbourne it today. It's Melbourne Cup Day. I love the sporting public holidays. In Australia, here in Victoria, where Melbourne is in particular, a few times a year we stop everything just for sport, which is great. <laughs> and today is um, a huge horse race. Horse the Melbourne race. Cup. The yeah. Melbourne Cup. Yep. It happens the first Tuesday in November. Is that when the U.S. elections on as well? Every four it's come, years? yeah, yeah. Is it's it it's U.S. elections tomorrow, our yeah, time. Our time. So yeah. here it is, first Tuesday in uh, November. So we're not at work. Uh, instead, we're here in the studio doing a podcast. Yes, and uh, a favourite topic of ours. So it's fun to be back in the studio talking about um, lymph node dissection. Pelvic lymph node dissection, and we have to come back to it. And we had a uh, previous version of this podcast a few years ago with our guest, uh, Kareem Tujir from MSKCC, who's joining us again today when he published the interim results of their famous randomised trial of standard versus extended pelvic lymph node dissection. And it was um, paper of the year in European Urology Oncology 2021. That's right, 2021. We... We featured it in our Ask a GU highlights in right. 2022. Yeah, February, yeah. you yeah. did when you were I speaking did, yes. at Ask a GU. Right. Yep. Uh, and we had Kareem on the podcast. and It was a very, very popular podcast. And um, people might recall, uh, we'll go through it in a moment again. Uh, in that trial, primary endpoint was biochemical recurrence. And um, when they read out that paper, they showed there was no difference between the limited and the extended pelvic lymph node dissection. Um, and there was lots of interesting uh, ca- you know, caveats to that. And um, we thought that was sort of put to bed. And then fast forward <laughs> to EAU this year. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, has been, it has been such a roller coaster for pelvic lymph node dissection in prostate cancer. And I mean, it, we went from something that was traditionally done, it was a traditional teaching. Then we realised there was no real oncological evidence for oncological benefit. And then recently, we in Melbourne celebrated our 10-year anniversary of using PSMA PET. And so the staging benefit of a pelvic lymph node dissection started to dwindle in the era of PSMA PET. Now here we are again. Yeah, and at the EAU this year, the other thing that happened was uh, the EAU prostate cancer guidelines were updated and to quite some surprise, really, there was a very significant downgrading of the recommendations for pelvic lymph node dissection. That's right. It completely disappeared for intermediate risk prostate cancer. Yeah, don't even think about nomograms, just it's not even mentioned. Right. And then for high risk, um, the wording is completely different. So it's not recommended that you do a new lymph node dissection, but if you do perform a pelvic lymph node dissection, the recommendation is to perform an extended. And I even stood up and did a plenary uh, <laughs> uh, 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 arguing against pelvic lymph node dissection in the PSMA era. I was very pleased with myself because the EU guidelines <laughs> had just been released. So it sort of supported my strong argument that I, I think I put up this slide saying the sun, in 2024, the sun is setting on pelvic lymph node dissection. I remember that beautiful uh, photo of it with Galway, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, the west of Ireland. Setting, yeah. That's right. The sun is setting. But then, then Kareem got up. Then five minutes later, <laughs> we left that plenary session, a huge session. And then in the other plenary session which was kicking off next door uh late breaking abstracts which are always hot abstracts get presented and um kareem uh, tujer uh, from mskcc was going to present an update of the trial so uh, i thought well let's rush in i better hear what kareem's got to say which brings us right up to today i think we're we're caught up so if you've caught up with us uh, let's go now and welcome our friend kareem tujer uh urologist at memorial sloan kettering cancer center new york and at cornell university who's come back on the podcast again to talk about the topic. Uh, Kareem, welcome back. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you both. And thank you for having this podcast on a holiday. <laughs> it's and great to have you, Kareem. You're such, a, you're such a friend of the podcast. I mean, we we love those photos of you with the GU cast hat. That's true. He wears yeah. the merch proudly yeah, as well. So yeah. that, is that why he came back on? He sort of <laughs> felt, oh, they've given me some free merch. I better turn <laughs> up again. <laughs> Um, so yeah, congratulations! A, a big paper in European urology that that is a, that is a big deal. So congrats to you and the and the rest of the team. Thank you very much, Renu. Thank you. So it's published in European Urology last week. Lots of reaction on social media, and of course, we knew what you were going to be saying in the trial. We'll, we we won't um, steal the thunder now, but there was some very big news uh, that you shared with the with the, everybody at the EAU in Paris, and now is fleshed out in this trial. Uh, the update from the randomized trial. Um, so um, do you want to just take us back a little bit, I suppose, tell us a little bit about the trial design for those who, who weren't aware. Tell us about that primary endpoint of biochemical recurrence. Um, we might as well say that that's still uh, no difference. Uh, and then the, the big breaking news that you observed other differences down the line uh, that caught everybody's attention. Yeah, so um, thank you for having me. And, and it's a pleasure to uh, discuss these points with you. Um, as you highlight, the most 
relevant parts of the science in, in this project. Um, I just want to start with an anecdote is that when I first started my career at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, uh, Peter Scardino, uh, one of the giants in urology, uh, asked me as a, as a young faculty and he said, well, Karim, you need to find a niche uh, for your research. So I went for a run in Central Park. And then I came out after that six mile run, I came up with the idea that nobody's interested in lymph node dissection and or the role of lymph node metastasis in prostate cancer. So I'm going to focus on that. Wow. Lo and behold, I thought <laughs> that everybody has forgot about that topic, but I did not know that it was the most controversial topic. That's why <laughs> nobody wanted to actually deal with it. But 20 years down the road, wow. here we are. That's um, a great story. <laughs> randomized trial. We discussed uh, the primary endpoint of this trial, which is a very specific trial. And I think we can talk about the mechanics and the design of the trial later if we have time, uh, because it's a clinically integrated trial. And a bit in short term, it's a low cost trial because it's fully integrated in what we do daily. And so this design allowed us to enroll a large uh, number of patients, close to 1,500 patients, which makes it one of the largest surgical oncology trial. And what the trial stem, stemmed from this controversy and in preparation for the trial, we had surveyed members of the Society of Urologic Oncology about when they do lymph node dissection what type of lymph node dissection, what anatomical templates. And as you could expect, these are very well seasoned, basically the elite of urologic oncology and the type of lymph node dissec dissection or even the importance of lymph node dissection was very divisive. People were all over the place in terms of what they do. And so we um, took some courage and launched this trial of limited versus extended lymph node dissection. The limited was basically, uh, I'm not going to call it in terms of semantics because there's no agreement even on the semantics, uh, is the area between the external iliac vein and the obturator nerve. So that was the limited pelvic lymph node dissection. The extended was this area plus the obturator fossa plus the the lymph nodes that are along the branches of the hypogastric or internal iliac which was then the standard at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So we embarked on this trial, the primary endpoint, which in prostate cancer, biochemical recurrence is the binary for surgery. And so it's easy, it's quick, and you, you get a signal or you get an answer. So that was our primary endpoint. And when we unveiled and analyzed the data, there was no difference in biochemical recurrence with a hazard ratio of basically one between the limited and extended pelvic lymph node dissection. Mm -hmm. And so then came a trial from Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, a bit smaller, about 300 patients, 150 per arm. And they looked at a li limited versus almost a super extended lymph node dissection because they had included the common iliacs. Our trial was initially criticized because the difference in number of nodes retrieved was not as wide as we had planned and expected based on our prior data. But the Brazilian trial had a six times more nodes, a six fold nodes retrieved and a five or six fold positivity detection or node on metastasis detection. Yet that trial again came back negative in terms of biochemical recurrence. And I think these two trials providing level one evidence supported the guidelines the, or sort of the change of heart in the guidelines and gave you the beef to present your data against <laughs> pelvic lymph node dissection. Only I didn't hold the piece in the room next to you when I said, <laughs> wait a minute, look, we have something new. <laughs> and didn't well, last long, yep. <laughs> Yeah. And what was new is that I think um, last time we had, when we discussed with you, Declan, and Renew about what are the lessons learned 
from our trial. And it was that perhaps biochemical recurrence was not the right endpoint, or perhaps our design of limited versus extended is not the right design to answer the question if there is a therapeutic benefit of a pelvic lymph node dissection. And so what we have done since our last podcast, GU asked, uh, is launched a trial equally large of pelvic lymph node dissection versus no pelvic lymph node dissection yeah. in prostate cancer. And then we, with more follow-up, we wanted to see if with more maturing of the data, there is a difference in our prior trial of limited versus extended pelvic lymph node dissection. And what we found is that there was still no difference with more follow-up, no difference in biochemical recurrence. But we were surprised to see that there was a statistically significant difference in any metastases and distant metastases favoring the extended pelvic lymph node dissection over the limited pelvic lymph node dissection. And that's the head scratching moment. Yeah. Why and how? And that's why you will see all the um, analyses that we did in the trial um, trying to see if our results are robust or data is the data, it could be a fluke in the data or a mistake. And we had the, these results analyzed by other statisticians that do not even work in prostate cancer. And we did sensitivity analysis trying to understand. And this, um, this concept of trying to shoot your own findings only to see if they hold true um, often I had asked my friends who are architects, how do you build such a marvelous stuff that stays for years? And this is actually the, the way they think about their building projects is they build it to fail. And if it doesn't fail, then it's good. <laughs> we did put our data through the mill, trying to see if there is something in it. And I'm happy to discuss it. Very good. Very nice so, summary, lovely story. And, yeah. and that was the big headline, wasn't it? That although no difference in BCR, uh, 10 years later, there seems to be a difference in the rate of distant metastases. And if you had the extended node dissection, you had a lower rate. And, uh, and that's what that's the head scratching is. We're all scratching heads. Even Kareem is scratching heads. I'm interested, Kareem. Why, why, why did you comment that? What made you say that BCR is not the right endpoint? So, because the thinking, of designing a trial based on BCR stems from the idea that if we don't do a lymph node dissection or we do a small lymph node dissection, or I should say precisely a lymph node dissection in a small area, that perhaps we're leaving some cancer cells in some lymph nodes that are going to cause biochemical recurrence that are going to spread into the bloodstream through the lymphatic and then eventually cause metastases. That thinking process is very Hallstadian. And the Hallstadian model that is over 100 years old, the thought process is the tumor grows to a certain size and then spreads to the lymph nodes that are going to travel in the lymphatic system, reach the uh, blood circulation, and then spread to metastases. And that thinking came from breast cancer. And the idea was that if you remove the primary, you could prevent the lymph node dissection, or if you remove the primary and the lymph nodes, you will prevent further disease dissemination. And the great Larry Norton at Memorial Sloan Carrying Cancer Center put it, and who spends a lot of time researching the, researching the metastases, the mechanistics of metastases and so forth. One day when he gave a lecture, he says, that's 1890. 
and the highest and the biggest technology, the most intelligent technology at the time was the steam engine. <laughs> and that could have conditioned our intelligence of interpretation that the steam engine builds pressure and then spews the steam and gives this energy that's going to move the trains and so forth and the boat. And so he says that that conditioned also our thinking of how we interpret and how we deal, we explain cancer metastases at the time. Luckily for Hallstead, at the time, by being this aggressive, he was able to save few women from death, from a certain death from breast cancer. And again, that reinforces the concept that, well, maybe that's the right thing and that's what we do. But then we know that after Hallstead came Fisher that basically explained that the metastases go through the hematogenous route and perhaps the lymphatics is just a hallmark of an aggressive disease. And today we are in completely different interpretation of our world using quantum physics, quantum mechanics, and and then comes the theory, which we will probably speak about later if this the question comes up, is the the Norton Massagay theory, where cancer is spreading from the primary to the meta to the distant metastases and from the primary to the lymphatics and from the lymphatic to the metastases and then from the metastases to the primary as a self-seeding theory. And so we are going to enter into the hypothetics of the trial. And I don't think it's going to be an answer, but it's going to be at least one way to help us explore the next research. Because as I said in Paris, the tri this trial answered one question, but opened Many a lot of other questions that are more on in terms of the biology of cancer and the biology of metastases. You know, the problem with Karim is he speaks so eloquently that I'm tempted to believe everything he says. He's lyrical as well. He's very easy to listen to. <laughs> but, but I think we should dissect this a yeah, bit. Yeah, let's further. go into this a bit yeah. because um, he did there very nicely try and explain in his head scratching uh, as a solution for the head scratching about wh why would it be if you take more lymph nodes, it might reduce distant metastasis. The idea that. And we're maybe, talking a couple more. Yeah, we'll come to that. Yeah. Uh, so, because we didn't dive into it here, we did previously. The difference between the arms is uh, 12 lymph nodes in the standard arm and 14 in the other arm. So is taking out two extra lymph nodes. And I think the operative time was two minutes. So, you know, it would be a very, um, very healthy, economic, effective thing to do if it reduces metastasis, spend two minutes and pluck out two more lymph nodes. How, 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 how can that lead to the reduction? So I think his hypothesis, and it's put out in the paper, a few hypotheses that there may be lymph nodes out there that we don't get them. The and, location if you take, specific, and if you get them yeah. Yeah, location specific, there's mm -hmm. something about the obturator internal iliac that maybe getting those might be an explanation for why they've observed this reduction in distant metastases. Um, but Kareem, um, we also had one of our colleagues, John Yaxley from uh, Brisbane. Uh, John's a urologist here in Brisbane. You might remember he led the open versus robotic surgery randomized trial that was published in The Lancet, um, a keen trialist. And, and we asked John a few questions. He couldn't join us live. And one of the questions we asked him about was, um, you know, what's the explanation for this? So let's have a listen to what John said. How do you figure out then, what's the biolo biological explanation for how there could be no difference in biochemical recurrence rate by those two lymph nodes, two extra lymph nodes? Because that makes sense to me. I, I can't see how there, there would be a biochemical recurrence rate. But how do we make the leap forward? Can you think of any biological reason why it could reduce distant metastases? So firstly, it could be the methodology. And you said you're going to talk to other people about that. And I'd I'd strongly advise an independent um, um, statistician to review this. This is a post hoc analysis of um, of a retrospective review of uh, a particular topic, i.e. does um, lymph node metastasis prevent distant disease? This was not part of the trial anywhere. And they firstly started with a one-to-one -one randomization and pretty soon after changed to a cluster rand to cluster analysis. So that may also decrease the power of the study as well. So really a statistician, it could be the statistics that explains this rather than some Un unexplained biological event. Um, the, the hypothesis that they're saying is that the unresected lymph nodes might subsequently metastasize to other areas, and that's certainly possible. But that's probably happened well before the lymph node dissection would have been performed anyway. 
So I can't really explain from these results how we can biologically explain them. So Renu, he thinks that while, okay, maybe it's leaving some lymph nodes behind that could metastasize, but maybe it's just the statistics. Yeah, I mean, instead of a biological explanation, which seems a little far-fetched, could this be a statistical phenomenon that we're seeing? What are your thoughts, Karim? Yeah, I think that those are good points. Um, I think John Yaxley spoke about independent statistician, and we actually had a memorial statistician who does not work in prostate cancer. We gave him the data set, and we said, could you analyze this for us? This is our question. This is our hypothesis, and this is the data. And they came up to the exact same, mm -hmm. same results. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think John spoke about cluster randomization, and I can tell you why we did the cluster randomization. Um, the cluster randomization stems from convenience. We initially started the trial as one-to-one -one randomizing patients, and many of us surgeons involved in the trial uh, perform anywhere between four to six radical prostatectomy a week. And so logistically, it was difficult to keep up with whether Mr. Smith or Mr. Jones is randomized to this and, and so forth. And that could, could have created some confusion. It is the same concept. The cluster randomization is instead of random, it's a bright idea of Andrew Vickers, instead of randomizing patients one-to-one -one and keeping up whether my first case in the morning is a limited and the second one is a, an extended and the following day it's an another extended, why don't we randomize the surgeons every three months? So from January to March, I could be randomized to either limited or extended. And then in April to June, it would be a different randomization for, for us. Mm. It is the same execution. The only drawback of the cluster randomization is um, the term cherry picking or selection bias. Mm -hmm. If I am a surgeon who feels, despite participating in the trial, that an extended is better, or if I see a patient with high risk of disease, I could, and I know I am randomized to the limited and I'm trained to do an extended and I'm not comfortable doing an, a limited in a high risk disease, I may not enroll the patients in the trial. But when we analyzed the first paper with that very specific point and we did not see that as an effect, we did not see that the surgeons actually sort of gamed the randomization, the cluster randomization. Yeah, they I remember actually, you making uh, a yeah, comment about that about in that first. And, and I remember I mean, you saying as well that actually a few surgeons early on came off the trial because they were they stayed doing more extended node dissections and uh, yeah. and uh, that was you know to maintain equipoise. Okay, just don't be in the trial. It didn't affect the overall numbers, but we understand that. But I remember you also explained to us that this might be one of the reasons why. The, the node yield in the standard group, which is supposed to be external nodes only, is higher than you expected. It's 12 nodes. And I think you said to us at the time in your trial design, you were speculating that should be like five or six nodes or something like that. So here's the question to you. And this is, again, part of the head scratching and the explanation is because 12 nodes were taken for the standard and 14 for the, you know, does it mean the explanation for the 12 nodes is that surgeons were taking a bit more than just the external iliac because it's more than you expected so going uh, outside the template going outside the template because that's the nature isn't it you know take yeah. some obturator nodes so yeah and and then that brings into a question that well how you know there's so little difference between 12 and 14 and surgeons probably were taking a bit more than the external uh again it scratches the head even more to how how, how could that make a difference taking two nodes will change the metastases especially as it's not the right. primary endpoint and especially we'll come to the imaging, especially because the imaging wasn't pre-specified, the me mm. method of detecting the metastases. But if you talk to us about the right. lymph node yield, yeah, your thoughts on that, because it, it was 12 is a lot for external iliac yeah. and you, you acknowledged that before it was, it was a lot more than you expected. 
You're absolutely right. I think when we built the trial, it was based on six to eight nodes in the limited. And keep in mind that these are not, the difference is not two nodes. It's the difference in the median is two nodes. Yeah. Um, and it is hard. And that's, these are the challenges of surgical trials. Because if you design a trial of for a five milligram lymphadenectomy versus a 10 milligram lymphadenectomy, it is hard to know whether the lymph node that the surgeon did is exactly five milligrams. It could be six milligrams, it could be seven milligrams. And what we have is this gross measure that we have is the number of nodes which usually correlates, there is plenty of data that says the number of nodes correlates with the extent of the lymphadenectomy. We do know that there is variation within patients. Some patients have more nodes than others, but we know that the rule which holds true is that the larger the lymph node dissection, the more nodes you're gonna find, and the more nodes you remove, the more likely you're gonna find a positive node. Now. I did another trial, I think probably after um, a prospective study after the last uh, podcast, is I looked at Cloquet's node, which is the most commonly removed node when we do uh, pelvic lymph node dissection for uh, prostate cancer. And the median number or, or the range of Cloquet removed was anywhere between one to four. And I picked a hundred patients with high risk disease did the lymph node dissection on the right and the left, but first removed cloquet area on the right and the left. And there were about 42% patients with positive lymph nodes because it's, it's a high risk population. Cloquet was negative in all but one patient. Yeah. It's interesting. So, which brings me to if Mr. Smith has cloquet and and the external iliac area removed, and Mr. Jones has the cloquet external iliac, internal iliac, and the obturator fossa, we may not have that much of a difference in note because the notes that we are removing are probably commonly negative notes. Um, but what's interesting about this analysis, and, and remember I told you I tried to shoot these results down as much as I could, me and Andrew Vickers and the group at Memorial. We did an analysis, and in the paper it's in the supplementary, and we found that the difference in metastases favoring the extended is independent of the number of nodes removed. And you could see the curve across the number of nodes removed, the, the difference between the two curves in terms of metastasis is maintained, which makes us believe, again, that has yet to be proven, that perhaps the location mm -hmm. is of a great value as well, where we go and look for these positive nodes. Now, what we learned from PSMA, and you guys champion PSMA universally for all of us. We found metastases and particularly nodal metastases in the areas that we didn't think prostate cancer went to before. We never looked in there, mesorectal, presacral, sometimes even inguinal, and in some more advanced cases. And positive nodes often laying be below the branches of the hypogastric, the superior vesicle artery. And you can do a beautiful extended lymph node dissection and still miss those. Yeah. I personally, as a surgeon, changed my technique to go look for the areas that are more likely to harbor metastases. And lo and behold, yes, we do find something that we could have easily missed. And the sobering of PSMA is that even when those of us that did extended lymph node dissection and some patients unfortunately had biochemical recurrence and we did the post-biochemical recurrence PSMA PET and there is a node 
that's positive right where we were working or right on the edge of where we were working. So again, in terms of that, there is so much to be learned. But with regards to the difference of node, I, what we have learned from this analysis is that perhaps the location of the nodes, some areas may have fewer nodes, but may have more positive nodes than others. It still seems like nodes. You're still talking about two nodes. People are still saying, yeah, but you took 12 nodes and then two more nodes. I know it's medians. How how can that how can that so the, be? How yeah, can there be a difference? It's hard to get your head and around. And especially that. the lymph node positivity is the same. So isn't that's it? that's the interesting in thing. The lymph it's, node positivity in both it's eleven and thirteen percent um, in the two arms. So they they're almost the same, and they're also very low. You're having you've got very low numbers of patients with positive lymph nodes, and they're the yeah, same in the two in, arms. And again, it brings the question: this trial, It's yeah. not only in in high risk disease. A lot of patients had intermediate. There were some uh, favorable intermediate risks. So, but again, you question that how can it lead to a difference in the, yeah. the distant metastases? But you know, because going back to the the statistics side of it, now I know Andrew um, Andrew Vickers, your your uh, senior author, um, friend of the podcast, Andrew's been yep. on a few times. Eminent uh, statistician um, has talked about this, but this issue of multi-testing. So what, because this was not the primary endpoint and I can see people on Twitter are saying this is not the primary endpoint. This is not what this was powered for. Um, uh, and, and but multi-testing. Uh, and multi-testing is the official term. There are some very colourful terms used yeah, uh, on, like on social media. Data dredging is one. Data dredging, that's right. So we had to, you, you looked this we, up. We had to look what it is up. data dredging? The other one is um, p-hacking. Yeah. So that was uh, that was an interesting one too. Yeah, and again, so we'll we'll ask for your comments on it. Understanding Andrew probably will. Uh, would but comment. multi-testing is the official term. Multi-testing meaning the primary yes. point has been analysed. There's no difference, and then you keep looking, you keep doing more testing and more testing and more testing. That's multi-testing. Um, but data dredging uh, or p-hacking, you can look these terms up, is when you do so much testing and you're going away from your primary endpoint until you get to a p-value that's significant, which is what's got this trial all the attention. Um, kind of a way of but torturing the data. P-hacking, yeah, is this term that, it, you know, it may well be that that it's not real, that the more multi-testing and the more data dredging you do, you're way away from the primary endpoint. Um, plus, in this instance, it's metastases you're measuring, which are measured on an imaging modality that's not pre-specified and different types of imaging are being used at different, at different time, time points. points. And the absolute difference is so small. You're talking about a few patients difference in each arm mm. that it could all be due to chance. Uh, it could just be, you know, a statistical right. chance here. And I think that's why there's quite a bit of reaction on Twitter to that. Uh, this the, the people wading in on the data dredging, p-hacking. That's my question to you. Could this all be just statistical shenanigans that so much multi-testing has been done, you found a p-value. It makes no clinical sense to many of us that you know, this difference of two nodes is leading to this. Um, so what, what's, what's your clinical reaction to that, uh, you having sat through well, all these meetings? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so some some of what you teach young researchers is not to keep the other word is you keep massaging the data until you find a positive p value and sometimes it does not make any sense. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about prostate cancer. The endpoints of pro prostate cancer are pretty um specified, biochemical recurrence, metastases, overall or cancer specific mortality. In general, these are the, when we run a trial in prostate cancer, these are the three or so endpoints. The statistical correction to multi-testing is that you increase the p-value. In other words, you can't be always looking for a p-value of less than 0 0.05, because that means exactly what you said, is that what you will find is due to mere chance. If you look at the p-value, and we addressed this, I think, in one of the paragraphs in the discussion, mm, yep. the difference here is less than 0, 0, 0, 0.001 for the p-value. This tells us that this is not a statistical fluke. This is not by chance. This is a robust finding. Now, how we explain it, we can we can talk about that, but I think we're going to get into hypothesis 
rather than than um, concrete conclusions. We can get into the biology, but statistically, this data is robust. We did analyze whether perhaps there is a difference in salvage therapy, type of salvage therapy, or time to salvage therapy. There was no difference between the groups. We don't necessarily use adjuvant therapy at Memorial, so that was not an issue. I think less than 0.5 or 1% in the paper might have had adjuvant therapy, so that's a negligible number when you're talking about 1,400 patients. We looked at surrogate of the biology of the paper, and we looked at PSA velocity, PSA doubling time difference between the two arms, and we did not find anything in terms of PSA dynamics that could tell us that, or maybe those patients that had metastases that happened to have an intermediate risk uh, I'm sorry, that happened to have a limited lymph node dissection had just a biologically worse cancer that just happened by chance. We did not see that uh, based on, on what we have. And we analyzed the data as difference from metastases, from radical prostatectomy to metastases. And then we analyzed the data from biochemical recurrence to metastases. And we find we found the exact same hazard ratios and comparable p-values, which tells us that perhaps this difference in metastasis is an event that happens after biochemical recurrence. And you could find that curve also in the paper. So we certainly went after our own data before we published it. And so it looks like it's an event that happens after biochemical recurrence. To quote. Larry Norton always says, uh, and I'm not sure if I'm going to quote him correctly, but he says that cancer cells find other areas of cancer to metastasize to. And if you look in the paper, we did an interaction term, and we found that the biggest impact of the extended versus the limited uh, lymph node dissection is seen in patients with positive lymph nodes. So hypothetically, you could argue that perhaps these patients are going to develop metastasis is just a matter of time, but removing more nodes in some very specific locations delayed that process to metastasis. Or if you consider that some metastases are dormant, then perhaps we reduce the amount of foci that will lead to distant metastases. And in fact, PN1, pathologically N1 disease, is where we saw the greatest benefit of an extended lymph node dissection. And we, we saw it in others, but that's where we saw the, the greatest impact based on the interaction term of the where the extended lymph node dissection makes a difference. Again, a p-value of less than 0.001. That refutes any concerns about multitasking, p-hacking. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure it does it, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I can get yeah. why you know, lots and lots of statistics have been applied uh, and those reassuring words, but I, I think a lot of people are still not convinced, uh, Kareem, and it'll be very interesting, I suppose, to see what the guideline bodies yeah. make of it. Karen, can I ask, um, so, you know, now that we're in this era of PSMA PET, and you've just said that the biggest advantage of an extended lymph node dissection in terms of reducing METs was seen in those patients who had PN1 disease. So do you still think that a node dissection has staging benefit or would you change your practice to only do an extended lymph node dissection in those who have PN1 disease on PSMA PET that you decide to operate on? Yeah, that's a very good question. The I, I get asked that question a lot in some of the meetings. The sensitivity of PSMA in detecting positive node is 33%, 31%, maybe 40% in some papers. And that is not a strong argument to replace a pelvic lymph node dissection by a PSMA PET scan. I have 
a number of anecdotal cases where, and we have some data coming up as well, and I think it was published in European Urology by Briganti and, and, and colleagues and some others. Um, I don't think a negative PSMA is a reason not to do lymph node dissection. We know the limitations of the five millimeter node size uh, in detecting positive node. In my personal, and, it, and again, it's it's gonna be anecdotal. I had cases where the PSMA showed two positive nodes and after a retroperitoneal and a pelvic lymph node dissection, they were 98 out of 112 positive nodes. Uh, 10 out of 22 node positive in the patients with negative PSMA. Um, so there is a lot to learn, but I think the limiting factor for PSMA to be the next stage in test instead of a pelvic lymph node dissection is the low sensitivity. Now, my trial says that it's beyond the fact that a pelvic lymph node dissection is a good stage in procedure. A good lymph node dissection, by that I mean an extended pelvic lymph node dissection, has been shown statistically to reduce distant metastases and any metastases. Yeah, yep, yep. We, we're not wavering from that line. I can see it. I can feel it. Um, uh, the other, uh, yeah, the other sorry, thing, the other way that um, of you know surgeons like to put this into perspective is number needed to treat. So, could you can you tell us? So, what is the number need? What is the number of lymph node dissections you need to do to prevent one met? I don't think I have that number exactly on top of my head. Um. I'll have to get back to you on that. Yeah, because that's interesting, Declan, isn't it? I'll have to get it's, back to you on that. Actually, there was a, a tweet about that. I'll read it out that um, Afonso Morgado, who, uh, you know, said... Uh, he was commenting from Portugal involved in, yeah, uh, your randomized trial concluded that lymph node versus no lymph nodes should be the next logical step. Actually, we want to ask uh, uh, Kareem true, yeah. that question because that larger trial, that large trial was also going to be running at the same time. So do no lymph node dissection versus lymph node dissection. And Afonso says that was the next logical step. But now we conclude that extended lymph nodes should be performed in all. So what's your per personal view? And Andrew Vicker says, quote, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? Close quote. <laughs> and Afonso said, well, I reanalyzed the facts. You know, he said, uh, if the first trial was premature to rule out a benefit, then this one might overreact on the conclusion that every localized lymph node dissection, uh, localized prostate cancer needs a lymph node dissection for like a 3% absolute MFS. Now, what Andrew says on the, on the number needed to treat, because Afonso says, what's the number needed to treat? He said, well, if doing 30 lymph node dissections is too much trouble to avoid one case of METs, then do feel free to omit this during your radical prostatectomy. So I don't know, is that his answer that it's 30? <laughs> Maybe but it's 30. I mean, and look, that's that's not a clinical, that's Andrew's not a clinical person. He's sort of saying, you know, yeah, do loads of lymph node, do 30 lymph node dissections to prevent one MET. Is, he's saying he's a kind of accusatory saying, if that's too much trouble for you, don't do it. But that's someone who doesn't understand lymph node dissection. And the morbidity associated with exactly. that for the patient. Which is why it's dropped out of the guidelines and will be dropped out. So so you do really need to justify it. And I think the number needs to treat thing will, will come up, won't it? Yeah. And, uh, I think that yeah. sort of answer is and, like for... And I want to get back to Renu's point about um, could a, a negative PSMA offset with other variables offset the need for pelvic lymph node dissection. I think that depends on what type of practice we have. Um, I think on the lower extreme, that will hold true in the, and I, I think someone on the tweet also said, well, I don't agree with your conclusion that says that if you do a pelvic, a radical prostatectomy, you should do an extended pelvic lymph node dissection. And then this person said, so what about low risk and favorable intermediate risk? Yeah, yeah, and you replied well. And the question is, I think Studer said that way before me, I think some 15 years ago, that if a lymph node dissection is not indicated, perhaps the radical prostatectomy not is not easy. <laughs> I think the low-risk disease, we have plenty of randomized trials, robust data that says active surveillance or active monitoring sure. is the best way to go. Yeah. Probably in some selected... Not Good probably, intermediate risk. Yeah. For sure, in some favorable intermediate risk disease, um, 
active surveillance is the best approach. Mm -hmm. And in the in the rest, there is room for focal therapy and others and other uh, less invasive approaches. So I think we're still I'm still back with Studer to say that if you are doing a lymph node dissection, do uh, if you are doing a radical prostatectomy, do a proper lymph node dissection. And my paper says that perhaps you will reduce your patient's risk for metastasis. And and um, before we wrap up, Kareem, uh, in a few moments, we want to ask about what, what do you think the guideline committees will make of mm. it? But back to that question of the, the other trial that we you spoke about before, the lymph node dissection versus no lymph node dissection. Because we were um, very excited about that yeah, one. Yeah, and there's also one ongoing at Martini Clinic, because yeah. especially after your initial paper read out, lots of people said, yeah, because the key trials now will be, what about doing no lymph node dissection, seeing as there's no difference between standard and extended. So yeah, please update us on on that trial. It must be impacted, we presume. So, yes, yeah, so some of the lessons learned was that we were able to do a limited versus extended. Remember, it's if you put things in the context, this trial was conducted before PSMA was FDA approved in the US. And where this, the norm was to do an extended lymph node dissection for some centers, some academic centers. At the time of designing and launching this trial, doing a limited lymph node dissection could have made people a bit uncomfortable. Completing the trial and showing no difference in terms of biochemical recurrence initially uh, made us believe that, well, we can actually now extend the question to, to lymph node dissection versus no lymph node dissection which we did, we embarked on an equally large trial of pelvic lymph node dissection versus no pelvic lymph node dissection, same methodology, and we were accruing patients. And when the results of our trial came back, uh, we felt that we did not have the equipoise to continue with that trial. So we immediately halted that trial. Um, I think there is uh, perhaps 700 patients, I'm not sure exactly on the number, that had enrolled in terms of in pelvic versus pelvic lymph node dissection versus no pelvic lymph node dissection. The group at the Martini Clinic, to my knowledge, have completed the accrual of their trial. And I'm not sure exactly where they are in analyzing their data, but it is a large trial of pelvic lymph node dissection versus no pelvic lymph node dissection. I am looking forward to see the results of that trial, but based on the design, I think high risk was not included. So I'm not sure exactly what patient population was included. That question was, was posed into which patient population. And uh, and I believe there may be another trial in the UK also in That's wrong right. patients. Mm -hmm. And there was one in Switzerland about to start or it may have started uh, recently. So more to come. Wow. More to come. Yeah, but it's such a thing. I can you can understand why, Renu, can't you? You know, you've you've run this other trial. You can see the data, and already there might have been some you know, concerns for s certain patients doing no lymph, doing a limited dissection. But then, what mm. what are you going to do? Try and recruit into a trial where there's going to be no lymph node no dissection, and so as you say, the equipoise gets lost. But that's the, again, hats off to people running large Absolutely. randomized control trials. Yeah. They sometimes have to then go, okay, uh, we're going to stop uh, at that point. Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, this this trial is interesting because, I mean, there, there are going to be two pools of people, right? Those who have, are big believers in node dissection who have been doing it, and, you know, as part of their routine practice will feel like these results will justify their efforts. And the rest of us are still kind of scratching our heads a little bit. But either way, um, you know, we have such huge respect for you and, and the team, Karim. You've been very gracious and these sort of thought-provoking trials are really important. They sure are. And and what we want to um, uh, do before we finish is we'll play one more clip from uh, our friend John Yaxi because I asked him that question, you know, uh, large randomized trial, you know, and, and the conclusion is here, um, is it going to change your practice? So let's hear what John said. Uh, and finally, um, finally, John, in the conclusion, it's a pretty strong conclusion, um, despite this being a negative trial for the primary endpoint, the conclusion is patients undergoing radical prostatectomy should receive extended pelvic lymph node dissection. Uh, so w will that be your practice now we, we've seen? Well, I, I, 
I'm trying to think of a polite way. I think there'd be a cheeky conclusion would be my answer to that, uh, and, and a cheeky request to the, um, uh, I suppose, to European Urology um, uh, to, to maybe reconsider their current guidelines. But honestly, um, the, the conclusion should have been if you're going to perform a pelvic lymph node dissection, there may be an advantage with an extended uh, technique rather than a limited because we haven't even proved that performing lymph node dissection alters 10-year, 20-year um, prostate cancer-specific survival rather than you have to perform an extended dissection at the time of radical prostatectomy. And just so people overseas know, in Australia, we've changed. We've seen like only 20% of Australians in 2024 receive a lymph node dissection at the time of radical prostatectomy. We've realised that this doesn't improve our patient's outcome. It causes morbidity, it causes potential harm, and it makes salvage radiotherapy more complicated if you've already had a node dissection with increased risk of lymphedema and possibly genital edema. So no, unfortunately, Declan, like much as I love the authors, uh, this is not gonna change my practice. Thanks very much for joining us, John. So Karim, what are your thoughts? I mean, Johnny actually is, you know, one of our most experienced prostatectomists and trialists, and he doesn't think it's going to change practice. What about you? What are your a thoughts? Cheeky conclusion. How about cheeky that? conclusion. <laughs> he did put that very that. polite. <laughs> Look, I, I know this is a controversial topic, and I hope that this is not the type of research that people will use to say, see, I told you, that's what I always believed in and not the type of research that say, well, that's a cheeky conclusion and because <laughs> I know what I believe in. The data is the data. It showed what it showed. And in fact, I personally were, was raised on believing that there is nothing better than an extended pelvic lymph node dissection. I ran the first part of the trial and my faith in the pelvic lymph node dissection was a bit on the test line. And yes, this was not the primary endpoint. The statistics are solid. And yes, as I said earlier, in prostate cancer, we have biochemical recurrence as a, as a good endpoint. We have metastases as a better endpoint. And we have the ultimate endpoint, which is cancer-specific mortality. Mm. The natural history of prostate cancer is protracted. If I am still in practice, I would hope to be invited in your geocast <laughs> and this podcast. And hopefully when I have longer follow-up <laughs> and the data shows whether there is a benefit in cancer-specific survival or not, I will be able to humbly say, well, this is what the data shows. <laughs> How very nice. Very From that nice first status. epiphany you had during your Central Park run to, you know, fast forward 15 years from now and you'll be here. It's saying, Scardino cheering yeah. you on. <laughs> oh, it's a lovely story, isn't it? And yeah. um, it will be interesting. And by the way, um, there is an editorial coming in the journal uh, on our editor's WhatsApp group, European Urology Associate Editors Group. Um, uh, we've been talking about this and there is an editorial coming, but it's not written yet. Uh, and it's being led by the EAU uh, Prostate Cancer Guidelines Committee, uh, Phil good. Cornford and co., yeah. Um, because after the AU guidelines, you know, Briganti had uh, said, we should, uh, let's have an editorial to explain your changes. And then when your paper came in, um, uh, they, they pivoted and said, well, hold on, let's get Kareem's paper through peer review. And then you please write an editorial about that paper, but also kind of a, a broader context, mm -hmm. because it was such a big change this year. Many, uh, especially the pro lymph node dissection lobby would say, and kind of just flesh it out a bit. So I think there'll be a very interesting editorial uh, coming, uh, which will be, that'll give us, a, I suppose, a sense of what a, a, that particular guideline committee, the EAU guideline committee, uh, might be saying in next year's um, uh, guideline update. Yep. And um, and depending on what they say, I suppose you might have a chance to respond to that editorial. So it'll, it'll play out a bit over the coming Absolutely. few weeks and months as well, Kareem. Oh, well. That's the beauty of science and, yeah. and humbling because actually it just creates the debates for us to keep yeah. asking the right questions and yeah. moving forward through the debate. Absolutely. Well, we love having you on, Karim. Uh, you're one of our favorite guests and, uh, and, and thank you for your time. And congratulations okay. again to you and uh, all your colleagues at Memorial for, uh, for this wonderful thing. Uh, please keep going, keep going. Keep on your going. Yeah, experience. absolutely. 
So that's all we have time for on this um, episode of GU Cast. Did you enjoy that? That really? was fun. It was fun with a yeah. great friend of the podcast, Kareem. Yep. Hats off to them. I'm still scratching my head a little bit. <laughs> uh, you're losing a bit of hair there. That's right. You're yeah, all that, that scratching. Great. That was beforehand. And um, uh, is it going to change your practice? I mean, we don't do lymph node dissection unless the no. PET scan is positive, and even then. You know, yeah, I mean, that's that. I think the ship has sailed a bit, hasn't definitely it? definitely left. But, yeah. uh, you know, we have to then challenge ourselves and say, are we disadvantaging some patients? This is very thought-provoking, but I, I don't think it's going to change practice in a country like Australia, especially where we've been polluted by uh, PSMA right. for uh, all these years. But the debate will go on, and this particular thing, despite my sun is setting on lymph node dissection, beautiful theme I did in March this year, it clearly has not set, <laughs> and this paper is, is very thought-provoking. So that's all we have time for. Very Thanks good. very much to Kareem uh, for joining us, and we'll be back very soon on another episode of uh, GUcast. Thank you. Thank you.